not a beautiful, lovely presentation because I'm a busy woman. And this is an academic paper, all right? This will be on the midterm. So here's the way this is gonna go. There's a lot of text on my slides. You can distract yourself and read the text and that's fine. You can listen to me talk, that's also fine. I welcome questions during the talk. If you don't want to ask me questions during the talk, that's fine, we should hopefully have time at the end. Um, and I chose this. For those of you who do not know who I am, beyond the CTO of the Runway, I happen to be one of the people that works on the Apache Zookeeper project. Not that much lately, but certainly have done significant work with that project and running it in production in large scale. So this paper is near and dear to my heart. Um, I read it long after I had started working with Apache Zookeeper, and it's, it is near and dear to my heart, not because it is this brilliant theory paper where this person proves an amazing theorem about a thing, and you're just like, oh my god, now I, the world can change. It's not that paper, right? It's very much an engineer's engineer's paper, right? It is about engineering. It is about what happens when you take concepts from papers, creates production systems around them, and then run them in the face of terrible programmers. <laughs> so, what is Jeffy? Jeffy is a lock source. Allows clients to synchronize their activities and agree about basic information around their environment, all right? It's designed to help developers deal with core screen synchronization, in particular, leader election. Most of you, many, maybe at least 50% of this audience, I'm going to guess, was not writing production code in the like early 2000s. In the early 2000s, we didn't have that many distributed systems and we had a lot of leaders, okay? We wanted to do things where we wouldn't have to like, you know, go log onto a box and, you know, fail something ourselves when it would fail and like have multiple servers running but not actually, you know, know which one was able to handle the traffic. We couldn't have multiple servers handling traffic, right? We had this problem with leaders, even in just like basic production systems, where you would never do that anymore, you just have your distributed database cluster run behind stuff. So it was like a big deal to be able to elect a leader. And this was a big pressing problem to all engineers back when this was written and back for this today. So they identified this need at Google, which was that for writing all these distributed systems, we need to coordinate them in some fashion. We need to provide distributed locks, and we need to let people elect leaders, because we have all these systems that we know they need leaders, and we need to elect them. Okay. How does it work? Very simple. Very simple. It uses Paxos. And we are not going to talk about Paxos. Don't ask me questions about Paxos. I am not a Paxos expert. There may be some people here who are, and maybe they will talk to you after the talk. But I am not a Paxos expert. I know it. I don't want to go on camera talking about that. Okay. So, but it is solving distributed consensus using an asynchronous communication method and it uses Paxos to ensure that that is a safe process. All right, again, interesting, not due to deep fundamental algorithms that they discovered in this process, but interesting because it talks very clearly, very well, and very eloquently about how you take fundamental algorithms and actually turn them into useful production systems for hundreds, thousands of engineers, thousands of different kinds of services, right? Okay, so now I'm going to skip the section where they talk about design, and we're gonna talk directly about the system structure first, and this is just gonna be very kind of rapid fire talking about the system structure, because I don't think that's the most interesting part, so. System structure, all right? You have this group of servers called a chubby cell, and Zookeeper, those of you, how many of you are familiar with Zookeeper and have run it? Okay, lots of you have run Zookeeper. Great, so I will probably translate these things back and forth into Zookeeper speak. And Zookeeper is going to be called Quorum, okay? Chubby has a master and replicas. And the difference, one big difference between Chubby and Zookeeper is that only the master serves traffic. All traffic, reads and writes, go through this master replica. All right, so small set servers, for whatever reason, they chose to use five. Uh, those of you unfamiliar or haven't really, you know, seen me talk about Zookeeper, for example, in the past, you always have to have an odd number of these replicas. You don't have to, but you don't get any benefit by having a non-odd number, because you have to have a majority surviving to be able to continue to function, to be able to continue to vote and have a majority there, right? That makes sense, right? 
If you've got five, you have to have three available. You can lose two surfers. So if you have six, you still have to have, you have to have then four available, right? So you can still only lose two surfers. So uh, numbers, uh, master hand is always the rest, great. The data model is a file-based data model. This is kind of nice. It's very like, you know, tangible concepts to engineers. It exports a file system interface. Some things sort of directly use this interface. Uh, you know, you have LS is the top of the path that indicates it's the lock server. The foo in this is the name of the chubby cell. So they can use that to actually resolve DNS and point you to the right cell based on what you're looking at. And then you've got your own interpretive namespace, right? Uh, Zookeeper is another small difference with Zookeeper. Zookeeper doesn't have anything in its namespace by default that tells you which quorum you happen to be a part of. You can put that in, but it's not you know, directly in the namespace in itself. Okay, only files and directly directories are in the namespace. We collectively call these nodes. Each node has only one name. There are no links, no soft links, no hard links. Nodes may be persistent, permanent, or ephemeral. Sorry, I want to call them persistent. That is the Zookeeper terminology. Different than Zookeeper. A few things different here. Directories can't contain data. Zookeeper directories can contain data. Any node can contain data and have children. Zookeeper, yes. Chubby, no. Chubby, it's very much like you're a directory or you're a file. You're not both. Uh, ephemeral is different in this as well. Ephemeral, for those of you familiar with Zookeeper, will be deleted when the client that holds that, that created that ephemeral node goes away. They are very much session based. In Chubby, ephemeral nodes are not session based. They are deleted if no client has them open, uh, but that doesn't, you know, but any client can have it open, right? So you can have multiple clients that have open handles to this ephemeral file and it won't go away until they all close those connections. There's also Ackles. As you mentioned, they would go to jail. They didn't have Ackles, so they have Ackles. Very rapidly, more miscellaneous. There's some per node metadata, instance numbers, generation numbers, log generation numbers, ACL generation numbers. These are all useful for bookkeeping, making sure that you are up to date with the latest version of whatever's on the server. I don't really want to go into that. Uh, handles is just a term that refers to what you get when you open a <coughs> node. All right, there's sequence numbers that tell you, again, a whole bunch of stuff about this. Useful for bookkeeping. We don't really care about that. Um, we're not implementing Chevy ourselves. If you are, good luck. Okay, let's talk about locks really quick because I think this is one of the parts of the paper where you may just breeze through it and be like, yeah, yeah, this is locks over, and this is what locks are, and that's cool. But let's dive in a little bit here because it's not obvious. And I know it's not obvious because I spent an hour with my TA over there uh, arguing about the meaning of these locks, um, what exactly he meant and why exactly he said what he said about string. So first, let's talk about the problem with distributed locking. The problem with distributed locking is the following. Server A gets a lock, sends requests, dies. Server B then acquires the same lock. In the meantime, the thing that we were sending those requests to gets requests that were serviced by server A. Right now, if server B starts sending traffic to that resource, and that resource doesn't really have any idea who's supposed to be talking to it, it's just gonna like respond, whatever, right? So, you know, it can be talking to B and then see a request from A and handle that request from A and send it back, and you just got this like totally like unordered sequence of events that you don't expect to happen. So, so you don't expect that the resource under lock by server B is going to be responding to requests from server A after it started talking to server B, but it might if you don't have proper distributed locking. So Chubby set out to help solve this problem, and it solved it, they talk about these two ways, right, okay? They talk about the backward compatible way, which is like, oh, you've got a bunch of old last code, and nobody's checking it, and that's fine, and so here's what we're gonna do. You're not gonna change your resources to check the locks at all. The resources are as resources have been, but we're gonna put this lock time. So if A loses its lock because it like dies, and it still has requests in flight, B can't get the lock and immediately start sending requests. So that resource may still respond to some requests from A after A has died, but it will not, hopefully, hopefully, it won't actually send those requests back after B has started querying it, okay? 
just sort of giving it time to drain out the queue of requests that were built up by A. Clear? Okay, good, that's clear. Then they go on this thing about sequencers, okay? Sequencer, great, you have sequencer, what is that? A lock holder can, can request the sequencer, super cool, it attaches the sequencers to the requests, the other servers, and then the other servers will just sort of validate that sequence information and all's good, okay. I found something confusing here. I found this statement to be confusing. The validity of a sequencer can be checked against the server's Chevy cache, or if the server does not wish to maintain a session with Chevy, the most recent sequencer that the server has observed. Okay, check it against the Chevy cache, no problem. If you're familiar with Zookeeper, you can, in your mind, imagine how this works. Like, oh, I'm the resource, and I'm just gonna like keep an eye on this node that indicates a lock, and when that node changes, Chevy sends me an update, and I know, oh, okay, great, I know it's changed, so if I ever get any response requests from A after that's changed, I just project them. But this is saying that I can safely just check the sequence number, and I don't have to have a reference to Chubby on my resource, and this will still be valid. Wanna? Okay, to answer this question, I believe, I answered to my own mental satisfaction that I could be wrong. You have to remember that they say very clearly up front in the locking section, these locks are advisory. All that they guarantee is that lock, con locks conflict only with other attempts to acquire the same lock. That doesn't, they do not make locked objects accessible to clients not well to know. Okay, so here's what I was concerned with, right? A sending requests, on a valid sequencer to a resource. A loses the lock, B acquires the lock. In the meantime, more requests, all these old requests from A are still being processed by the resource, right? A has lost the lock, but the resource is still processing them, and it doesn't see anything wrong with that because it has not received another sequencer that would indicate anything is amiss. That would be wrong if we were talking about mandatory locks. But advisory locks only mean that you care about it the minute that you can observe a conflict. So we only observe a conflict once a request from B hits that resource. Once a request from B hits that resource, they say, ooh, this is a new sequence. I'm in a new state. And the sequence is valid, it's a new, it's a forward-looking sequence. Somebody new must have my lock, I'm now gonna process only that person's request, and I am gonna reject any requests from the old sequence. Yes? Any new requests or will the yeah, existing requests finish from A? Uh, that's a good question that I don't know the answer. All right. I'm sure I will guess it depends on how you implement it. <laughs> but that ensures essentially that you are never going to see a request from B on a new sequence and then see an old request from A and still service that request. But you also don't have to talk to Chubby on the sur on the sort of resource side to be able to safely do. Cool? Cool. This is like the only insight I got out of this paper. <laughs> All right, moving on. Events. When you create a handle, you can, serve out, you can subscribe to events. Events are awesome. If you're familiar with Zookeeper, events are like really important. You can be told when files are modified, when child nodes are changed, when the master fails over, when the handle is invalid. They probably have some other ones that I didn't bother put in here. It always is delivered after the corresponding action has taken place. Now these events are really important because Chubby is a system, Chubby Online Zookeeper has a very thick client. The client in Chubby does a lot of stuff because they observed very, very early on in the process of creating the system that traffic is really kind of expensive in Chubby land, and so we wanted to create clients that could really handle you know, that we could have a lot of clients out there, but the clients wouldn't be just spamming us with traffic all the time. So we have these sort of thick clients that the, client, the actual developers don't have to implement themselves. They are implemented by the Chubby team and bestowed upon them via a .so or something that the C++ Okay, right, so, so moving on from events very quickly, this all sort of ties together, you know, bear with me. Clients cache the file data and most metadata via this in-memory write-through cache. So again, if you're familiar with Zookeeper, this does not happen. You have to implement this pretty much yourself, right? When a node is changed anywhere, 
in the system. We don't just like change it in the master and then say we're changed. No. The modification of that node is blocked until all of the caches invalidate and acknowledge they have invalidated that node, then we modify. Then what happens is that the updates only invalidate on the client side. So the client invalidates their node, sends the request to update to the later, presumably for the master, right? The master says, everybody else got to invalidate. We're all invalidated, okay? Now, even the client who requested that right is invalid, but the client has to now request another read of that file to refresh that data. So this means that you're not like preemptively pushing these rights down to all the clients. The sort of assumption is like, you may not really need to know the latest state all the time. We may not actually need to notify you all the time. We just want to make sure you're not caching anything stale. They are way more obsessed with you not reading stale data in Chubby than we are in Zookeeper. Okay, Chubby, probably for good reasons, is very, very obsessed with you not reading stale data. This is why you cannot connect to anything but the master. Because you cannot be guaranteed in these protocols that if you're connected to a node that is not the master, that when you do a read, you will read the latest value. You can always get behind. In Zookeeper, we just say, look, you, you have a bounded time in which if you're connected to a core member who's lagging, you might be a little behind, and we provide some commands that will force flushes so that you will get the latest data if you really care. A lot of times, you just don't really care that much. Okay, so we want to force everybody to invalidate. We have all these like really strict notions in our mind about what correctness is. I mean, my bros, I care very, very much about correctness. Very much. Very much. <laughs> so I want to make sure that you, my dear clients, do not cache a thing. And you don't invalidate, and you just hold on to it, and keep it, keep it tight, and you've got this invalid data, because that would drive me crazy. That would drive me so crazy. You could be reading stale data. No. No, it's the worst thing ever. So we have to keep these sessions alive to Chubby, right? This is staple, staple stuff, right? Most of the things you're doing here on these clients to server things is staple, OK? So we create sessions, relationship between Chubby, uh, Chubby client and Chubby cell, maintained by these people lives. They are created on first contact from the client to the Chubby master, and they end when they are terminated or when they're left idle with no open handles and no, no calls, no action going on. Again, another slight difference from Zookeeper. Zookeeper, as long as your thing is open and sending heartbeats, you'll be alive. We, we won't just preemptively close you. Keepalabs are not quite heartbeats. They're, they sort of act like heartbeats. You can think of them as heartbeats. But they do some interesting things. They are a special RPC that is blocked <coughs> at, the, at the master. Until such time as the client's timeout, the client's session timeout is almost out, and then they respond back and say, now you can increase your timeout lease a little bit longer. Okay, now, the nice thing about these is they're handled on the same thread, I'm assuming it's a thread, they're handled on the same thread that handles all other events, including cache invalidations, including other kinds of notifications that you absolutely must act against if you are to stay in valid state in your client with respect to Chuck. So this is actually very similar to the way Zookeeper event thread works. If you've ever had to reason through the Zookeeper event thread, you know it can be kind of mind-bending because you can be getting lots of different kinds of events. Your heartbeats are actually going through this thread, right? And if something goes wrong, you can be just, you know, sort of thrown off into never never, right? These are, there. there's also all of this handling of what happens when you get disconnected. So let's talk about that really quick. And I, I apologize for my like weak ass slides, but it's graduate school, what do you want to do? How many of you actually went to graduate school? Yeah, okay, it's like, you know. This is like pretty good, actually. I went to some chubby slides from like other professors. I was like, I could do at least that well. Uh, okay, so just told this straight, straight, out, of, straight out of the uh, presentation. Okay, so what's happening here? Basically, you got a client. And your master dies for whatever reason. And a new master must be elected. And in the meantime, you do not want your clients to all have to disconnect, not just disconnect, but lose their sessions. Because sessions are really big. 
Sessions are used for big things. If you lose your session, a whole bunch of stuff is lost. You may fail over like a big table master thing and that would be really expensive, so we don't want to do that. So instead, what happens is you can go into this jeopardy period whereby your event thread, I'm just going to call it the event thread, gets the message that is disconnected from the master and just continues to try to reconnect and reconnect and reconnect and reconnect. And finally, once it does, it just restarts itself, essentially, right? Basically, we don't want to expire all our clients when the master fails over because reestablishing sessions is a giant pain in the ass. Okay, so the client can't do any new work during this Jeopardy failover period, but it doesn't close the session. You know, it doesn't lose all the work that it's already done, all the stuff that it has set up for itself. All right, this is an important part of the design around, you know, we're supporting these coarse grain locks, we're supporting things that are kind of expensive, and that means we don't want to lose them if at all possible. How many of you tweeted this? Like, everybody on my Twitter list. Uh, you'll be unsurprised to learn that the failover code is exercised far less often than the other parts of the system. It's been a rich source of interesting bugs indeed. I can't tell you what they are because he doesn't really talk about them. Um, but you are welcome to troll through the history of the Zookeeper mailing list for some potential examples. There are many of them. All right. This is the Chubby system structure. Fairly, not, not super straightforward, but straightforward enough, right? They say it's like 7,000 lines of C++. In the server, it's 7,000 lines in the client. So that's, you know, that's not tiny, but that's not huge. All right, let's talk about the design rationale. The reason that I love this paper is not because I find that the details of the way that they implemented Chubby, which are slightly different than the details of the way that Zookeeper was implemented. I don't, that's kind of interesting. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not like a that kind of person. I'm interested in how things fail and how engineers really work and how you make decisions. So, there were two key design decisions made when they conceived of and started to build out Chubby. The first is that they were building a lock service. Service is more important than lock, as opposed to a library or just a simple service to create consensus. Second. It serves small files. So you can actually use the service not only to get logs, but actually to share data, such as advertisement and configuration information. Why not libpaxos? Gosh, I really like libpaxos. Why don't you guys just give us libpaxos? A client Paxos library would depend on no other services. That would be great. And would provide a standard framework for programmers, assuming their services can be implemented as state machines. Oh, that's just, oh, just, oh, just assuming they can just implement those services as state machines. That's, that's no basic. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm actually surprised by the lack of response here. That is like crazy. That is like, that is the most understated piece of British wit in this paper, okay? <laughs> because hell is other programmers, all right? So there are many advantages to doing a service instead of just a lib access. Like, number one, developers don't plan for HA. I don't think about that shit, man. I'm just trying to like get my little experiment out the door. My product manager is really writing me hard tonight. Okay, they don't plan for it. And if you want to use a consensus protocol, you have to like, you know, have like a state machine in there. And the code has to be specially structured, which is actually pretty freaking hard, like a non-trivial activity. And services can enable you to have code that has correct distributed locking without having to rewrite the whole service when you realize that this is a thing that you need. Wow, that's really useful. I'm building a thing to run in a company with thousands of developers. I really do not want every single development team to have to re-implement their code when they realize that they need distributed locking and the only way to do it is to implement with that. <laughs> Trolling talk right now, really. <laughs> We would probably Andy if he was here. Okay. Service advantages too. All right, when you are electing a primary or partitioning data dynamically, you often want to tell people what the result of that was. That's just kind of like a sort of obvious and hindsight thing, right? So supporting the storage and measuring of small files is really useful, and DNS is a pain in the ass way to do it. You can do it with DNS. DNS actually does support serving small amounts of data, but DNS, TTL will kick you very hard in the teeth. 
Advantage number three, programmers think that they understand lock-based interfaces, and they may not actually understand lock-based interfaces. And he makes it very clear he does not actually believe that they do understand lock-based interfaces, but some of them at least find it familiar and comforting. And so at least they will have like one less bit than is a total act. Their locks will probably still be wrong, but at least the locks themselves will be correct. Okay. No stale locks in this, in this house. Finally, part four. Distributed consensus algorithms use quorums to make decisions, which means they have to have replicas, which means by default they're implemented in this sort of HA way. That's really nice, and this actually has sort of a lot of, of interesting you know, implications, but basically not forcing your client to be perfectly all available when it needs to make safe decisions like this can be very useful. Right? It's nice to be able to let your clients continue to run even when they don't have a majority. And figuring out how to take your giant pool of machines and create a sub quorum that's going to be used for consensus also, I suspect, is a very nasty and difficult problem to solve. And you probably would not really want to solve it unless you're trying to sell a database. Okay, take a breath, take a break. After all of that, <laughs> the other point is almost almost seems like it's just like not that big a deal, which is, oh, by the way, we're supporting coarse grain locking. We're not supporting fine grain locking. We're not supporting, you're going to take a lock every millisecond. You're going to get it and throw it away, get it and throw it away, get it and throw it away. No. They are supporting coarse grain locking, which means that there, these locks are very weakly related, if at all, to the transaction rate of their applications. They're acquired rarely, and they have, you can build a system that supports much lower load. All right, coarse grain locks tend to protect things that require very costly recovery procedures. And again, in the early 2000s, and probably still to this day, like it's really easy to reason about a master-based system, and so you kind of want to write one, and it's really nice to have a system that lets you just reason about a master-based system and write that. Uh, and course grain locking supports that really nice, right? This also means, though, if you decide that this is the model you're supporting, you need to create something that's going to survive system failure. Because if you lose your locks when your system, when your consensus system fails, and it may from time to time, you're going to cause a lot of pain on your clients. They're not going to want to use you if every time you have a hiccup or there's a network hiccup between them and you, all of a sudden, they have no locks, they have no master, and they're you know, starting a two-hour recovery process. If you want my grain locking, you can implement that yourself using Chubby in some magical fashion. I'm sure it works, but I don't really know how. All right, what are the learnings? Oh, God. <laughs> I feel bad I'm putting it in here. All right, how did people use it? Uh, answer the user for naming because DNS sucks. All right, most of the traffic was in session people lives. There were a few reads, there were very few writes. That was the way that the people that used this service, and they observed them in real time as they were using it, that's the way they used them. They had few little outages, the network always fails, because the network tear is terrible. Maybe Google is better than some, but it's still terrible. And you know, occasionally the database is just a little screwed up and you just want a greater error. But they actually had very relatively few failures to report at the time that this paper was written. They learned something about the performance sensitivity of people using Chubby, which is that clients really care about the latency of Chubby because they're not really doing very much with Chubby, right? They like write one thing and they leave it for a really, really long time, and that's about it. Did you notice the bits where they like were like, oh, we're just gonna add random like latency into the clients <laughs> until they notice it, ratchet it up, ratchet it up, and they just didn't nobody noticed until like like they had like, you know, really like hit them very hard over the head. Like, nobody noticed because nobody cared. Okay? Nobody cared about the latency to Chubby. But they were really, really sensitive to the latency of their actual local cache. Again, this was a, a you know, intelligent design decision that the, that the creators made to create these sort of really thick caches. They knew that like, people are going to want to read a lot. And if we make them do the round, network round shit, that's going to be a real pain in the ass. But if we can create these very accurately, you know, whatever, local caches, then they just you know spin those reads as much as they want, and it doesn't matter. The server would overload about you know nine thousand sessions, or if the client spammed a lot, and the scaling really depended on reducing communication. Which means if you like it, then you should have put a proxy in front of it. All of these problems, they just put proxies, proxy, 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 
Java compatibility? Who writes Java code? Come on. You heathens at my doorstep. Google 2004. Oh, jeez. Uh, okay, it's not quite a proxy, but I would, I would sort of call it a proxy, basically. Uh, oh, name service. Everybody's using us for a name service. They don't really need it to be like quite chubby level crazy accurate. So we can create also like a, a little proxy thing for our name service, right? Which is a trusted process that just pro passes requests from other clients through to a chubby cell. It just provides an aggregation point so that you know, you've got fewer people lives going to chubby itself. Those people lives have to be handled in the proxy is that some of those proxies probably had almost as much complexity in some of their code as Chevy itself did, but it doesn't have to have the voting and all of that. Right? So, ladies and direction, proxies are useful. Most people want a name service. Why do most people want a name service? Because DNS is a pain in the ass to scale. And I think they did a really nice job of explaining this, right? You have 3,000 servers, they want to communicate with each other, they have a 60 second time to live, that is 150,000 lookups per second. That is a lot, okay? This is for 3,000 servers with a pretty like, long time to live. So this is clear, DNS does not scale forever. DNS is great, maybe it scales more now, I don't know if I'm guessing probably not, because it doesn't have a change. Uh, right, if it changed, it probably wouldn't be as reliable as so we should be grateful for that. Uh, you know, Chubby can handle more clients than a single DNS can, but not enough more. But also they just don't need to talk to Chubby as much, because you know, that's great, so the proxy on. Okay, did we mention the problem with other programmers and how they are difficult? They will write loops that will constantly retry failed commands, they sure will. They will try to use this as a data storage service, they sure will. They will write like a lot of data in there and that causes a lot of problems. They think that a lock server makes for a good pub sub messaging system. <laughs> yeah, it really doesn't, no, don't do that. Okay, they rarely consider availability. They don't think about failure probabilities. They don't really understand distributed systems. They pretty much blindly will follow your APIs, but also kind of not really read the documentation. They write terrible bugs, and they basically don't predict the future very well. And that goes for Mike himself, as he admits in this paper. He really did not predict exactly the way that the system would be used. Fortunately, he's a brilliant person, and so it doesn't matter how much. <laughs> so how do you mitigate the impact of developers? If you have ever had to support a large centralized production Zookeeper service, you're familiar with probably all of these things, which is you can review all their code, review the way that they want to use the system, then you entirely control the client, and then you just insert random like time timeouts in the client so that if you do something bad, it's gonna be really painful to you. And finally, you throw up your hands and say, okay, I can't deal with these maniacs, I'm gonna aggressively cache even more than I thought I was gonna aggressively cache when I originally designed this. In conclusion, centralized services are useful for many reasons. Creating shared core architecture is really hard and it is really impressive how well this system did and has held up to time. Developers can and will screw you. Always, always. Tell with other developers, never forget. Having fundamental insights and empathy with your customer, which is, in this case, other developers at your company. Helps you make actually really good decisions, right? Helps you think about, like, know really what is the problem that I am trying to solve. They were, I think, the, one of the best things that Mike did with this paper, and hope, I'm gonna sort of assume that he did it in real life too, I don't know, is he made it really, really clear what this system was for and what it was not for. And by having that Clarity, it's very easy to communicate. Not fine grain locking. No, bad, bad developer. Not fine grain locking. Coarse grain locking only. I'm going to review your code until you understand coarse grain locking only. But that meant that he built something very thoughtful, very specific, very well tuned for exactly the use cases that it needed to, ser to serve. And those use cases were really, really important. And this is the lesson I hope you all take away. Even if you don't understand any of the rest of this, thoughtfulness, empathy with your client is useful even when you're an infrastructure developer, believe it or not. <laughs> that is the end. I thank you and we'll welcome questions.
Warrior library makes Zookeeper more similar to the Chubby sort of experience? That's like the narrator the library? Narrator, or curator. Like, wait, is that the Zookeeper one? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's what so the question is, is curator from Netflix, which is a client that wraps the sort of generic Zookeeper client, make Zookeeper similar to Chubby? And the answer is maybe. I don't know the details of what Curator does that well. I think that probably somewhat yes, in that like one of the challenges of Zookeeper, for those of you who haven't used it, is that you kind of have to implement everything from base primitives, right? Whereas it's very clear that like Chubby implemented some of those primitives for people, right? And Curator tries to do that in Zookeeper as well. And I think that if you, you know, I, I think that probably in reality, yes, you should just use Curator and, and you should give people big clients. And I think that was maybe a little bit of an error on the part of the Zookeeper team. On the other hand, like some people really want to handle different kinds of failure and different kinds of being disconnected very differently. And Zookeeper doesn't have the, quite the level of strictness of sort of freshness of data that Chubby has. And I think that is difficult to overcome that with a thick client. Unless maybe, I mean, I think you could probably figure a way out to do it. But that's the nice thing about Chubby is that they can have these big clients and they can cash really aggressively and they can know that the master is going to tell them when that thing is is invalid and it's going to really like punish you if you don't clear it out, right? Whereas with Zookeeper, like you really have to implement that and implement it correctly. You know, you better be connected to a node that doesn't drift too far behind the leader, because you can drift a little behind the leader. It depends on how accurate your own correctness assumptions are. So there's kind of like more flexibility in Zookeeper, but also more ways that you can screw it up as a result. Yeah. So I work on pub sub messaging at Google. Yeah. Uh, so you're you're right. Everything you said is absolutely right, by the way. It's like, I, you know, Someone from Google just said I was right, so. <laughs> <laughs> Programmers thinking they know how to use locks uh, and not knowing how to use locks, like that's even with this interface, you can you can mess it up, right? Like you have this caching uh, that Chubby manages for you, and then like you might naively copy something out of the cache, and then you now you have two copies of it, and you're like the Chubby client library is managing your cache and it's up to date, but you still have this you know like <laughs> out of date cop so like you know. And like what you said about the Chubby team, like there's a guy down the hall who <laughs> works on the Chubby team who basically he has white hair and a beard. And every time I see him, I just, I feel comfort. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we shouldn't drive people out of the industry when we're yes. 45. Because who's going to give us comfort? Yes. Who's going to give the youth of America comfort? He looked like that before he started working on Chubby, for the yes. record. Yeah. 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 You, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah I trust him very much. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. I was surprised that Chubby maintains these um, permanent sessions with 90,000 clients. It seems when you have 90,000 clients, one of them is going to misbehave or die every time you need to deal with them. How do they avoid <coughs> having huge time <coughs> So I don't know the answer exactly, right? So the question is, there's so many clients that could get connected to these chubby cells. And given the likelihood of one of those clients terribly misbehaving and affecting everyone else, how do they make sure that that doesn't happen? The, 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 the breadcrumbs that the paper gives us are the following. That they make it really clear that developers don't care that much about latency of stuff. So when you write, Sometimes those writes take quite a while to propagate through the system and, and sort of be done. And it doesn't seem like it caused, up to the point of this paper, that it caused them that many problems. Um, I guess the other point is that they do say that they have problems when a single session is like really spamming them. Like if it's cache is misbehaving and being constantly invalidated and, and spamming them, and they do have that problem. And I think the way that they handle it is they review the code, they review the systems, they punish bad behaviors in their client logic itself by putting these sort of exponential backoffs and things like that into the client logic. 
So, you know, I don't know. I mean, like, that's, that's all the paper can tell me is that. I don't know if one of our Googlers wants to chime in, but. Well, I, I just wanted to add two quick things. So one, one I, I haven't been to Google since the internship in 2007, so I have no idea how it works now. But I do know that they would just kill your service if you were really misbehaving. Like, there are people who actually wrote good code who would kill your crappy code. <laughs> um, but the second thing is, is that because it's mostly read traffic, and because they have the heartbeats that are like, I don't know who asked the question, I don't know who talked about it. Um, because they're a lot of read traffic, and because they have the heartbeats, they, they, I, I'm pretty sure they use multicast. Oh yeah, like, there's UDP, yeah, they're talking about UDP, which is like, so there's props to Google networking that they can make up. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> I think that it's that actually, the, the way that it works is, you know, remember like all these um, events are getting piggybacked on the response to the, um, heartbeat RPC, and so you know a client exists because it has a pending heartbeat, but when you send a response, you don't wait for that response to get embellished before you know proceeding. So it's okay if you send a bunch of cache embellishments <coughs> and some of them get lost because that's like within the semantics of the protocol. Because you know they're going to be, it's going to be the, the clients that I think are active, it's going to try to piggyback those and validate on the responses, and then the responses are just kind of right. I'm always the client and actually. Yeah. Well, I'm not actually, I'm not actually sure you're right about that. I think my suspicion is that they expect the act of the invalidation to be paid back on the key boy. And if there is no act of the invalidation on the key boy, they don't acknowledge the key boy. You can't, they're, they're not going to let you keep alive if you don't get that acknowledgement. That's my suspicion. I could be wrong. I think the paper says the other way. Does that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah. I'm not sure I understood the original question correctly, but just in case, none of that will help you if you have a client that is just aggressively just reading too much or trying to open too many files and just taking way more than their share of the cell's resources. And and what I'm imagining is that with 90,000 clients, one of those clients is going to be dead. Um, dead is okay. You know, they keep like within 12 seconds or something. You'll realize when they don't actually keep alive that they're not right. Anymore. We don't actually have to block until we know it's dead. Exactly. So yeah. I think your problem is they're spamming. Yeah. And there's, a, there's, you know, you get some hints in the paper about, uh, per, I guess in particular there was a problem with spamming on open. If a client tries to open a file and it's not there, they think it must just not be there yet, and surely it will be there if I look again. But um, sometimes they don't really understand the events. And they read the API. <laughs> yeah, and that's where they put in the like the the arbitrary sixty second delays that no one noticed. Is, you know, they it's designed to be used on a on a secure network, right? So it's not a web service. It's like an inter it's an internet service. Yeah, so so it it. It still has adversaries, which are basically bad programs written by bad programmers, but it, it has much more influence over them than it would, you know, a spam network from like Russia or something trying to do whatever, right, to you, so from the outside. So there's like many other ways to solve that problem. And just sort of an updated cheating answer, not in the paper at all, but they are also just rate ACLs on the RPC system now, so you just can't send too many RPCs to it. The, the underlying system enforces that. Is that on the, on the RPCs in general? Yeah. Or is it, okay, so uh, what do they call it? Stubby, that? Stubby, that's right, yeah. Stubby. It's also important to note that like, with, with such a like, strongly consistent cache, you can do all kinds of things in the cache, like you can grab read locks in the cache like without talking to the server. Because then, like, if someone wants to grab a write lock, then they just sort of do like similar to like invalidation. Um, so like, they can really like cut down on the read trap. But like, yeah, if you're if you're opening every file in Chubby, there's nothing stopping up that really. RPC rate. Other questions? Anyone in the back? Anyone else? Okay, uh, it was super fun. Apparently we have a couple of Google engineers here so you can just like talk to them about how this actually feels like in production. Although um, that one's coming home soon, so. Um, uh, it was super fun being here. Thank you all so much. Happy to chat a little more before I go home. And